Okay. Yeah. Can you see it well? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, thank you everybody for being here today. Uh, my name is Jose Ramon Vasquez Cantelli, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Texas at Austin. And my topic of PhD defense today is about multi-agent reinforcement learning for demand response and load shaping of grid interactive connected buildings. So my presentation will be divided in three main topics. First, I will be talking about demand response and load shaping, uh, what they are, what the main challenges uh, in the field are, and then what, what's the advantage of using reinforcement learning, what it is and how we can use it to control energy systems. Then in the second part, I will be talking more about CityLearn, which is a, a, a simulation environment that I developed and that can be used uh, to improve standardization and reproducibility of the research in this field and to implement reinforcement learning in, for demand response in urban energy systems. And then I will be talking about multi-agent reinforcement learning and how we can use it for demand response and load shaping and whether it offers any advantage compared to single agent reinforcement learning. So first, the big picture, what is demand response? Well, so in the, in the US, buildings account for about 70% of the electricity consumption. And then globally, uh, in the world, buildings account for about 40% of the global energy use and 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. However, it's not only important to reduce energy consumption, but also to consume it more effectively at, at the right time. So it's very important at what times during the day we consume electricity. Even if we are able to reduce the electricity that we consume, if we still have very high peaks of electricity consumption at certain times, then the cost of electricity might be higher because uh, at different times we might have, we might have to increase the, the sizing of the power system, invest in, in bigger transformers, and then the electric uh, power infrastructure will be more expensive. And then also having very sharp valleys or peaks of electricity consumption leads to other problems uh, because we need to generate electricity really fast. And typically to do that, we will need to uh, emit more greenhouse gases as typically this is done by using combined cycle power plants that consume a lot of natural gas and are able to provide this ramping, ramping up electricity consumption really fast. So as I said, it's not really important to choose when it, to uh, reduce energy consumption, but to specifically con control at what times we consume it. Uh, so demand response is all about doing that. It's about modifying the energy consumption patterns uh, so we can shift the, uh, the peaks of, of energy consumption towards the peaks of renewable energy generation and overall try to flatten the curve of electricity consumption. And there are many ways of doing it. One of them is using incentive-based programs, in which consumers are directly paid a specific amount of money to curtail their loads. So for example, they might pay a consumer money in order to stop the AC in the summer when the energy consumption might be very high in order to try to flatten the, a very high peak of electricity consumption. And then other programs are called time-based programs that more people might be familiar with uh, as they provide different prices of electricity in advance to the consumers at different times of the day. And then knowing these prices in advance, the consumers can modify their energy consumption accordingly. And then this is a way of providing economic incentive to the consumers trying to shift their electricity consumption patterns in a way that we can flatten the overall curve of electricity demand and the load profiles. However, the main problems and challenges with demand response is that electricity is a commodity that has a very high value for the price that we pay for it. So consumers are typically willing to pay 10 to 20 times the price of electricity just to avoid one hour outage. And then we have another problem, <coughs> which is the decision fatigue problem, <clears throat> which is that consumers don't typically want to be tracking the prices of electricity at all times in order to modify their energy consumption habits because over time they just get tired. 
therefore, the, my, the main conclusion here is that in order to have a successful demand response program and be able to modify the energy consumption effectively, we must do it in a way that is automated and without uh, penalizing or reducing the satisfaction and the comfort of the consumers. Therefore, what loads can be possibly automated in such a way that, uh, that doesn't, pen doesn't penalize the, the satisfaction of the consumers? Well, we have different types of loads. Some of them are more flexible than others. The, more, the most flexible ones uh, are the ones that just store energy and, and we can use it at a later time really easily, such as batteries, elect electric vehicles, or also uh, domestic hot water heaters that we can supply energy to using yeah, either electric heaters or heat pumps. So any kind of thermal storage, including the thermal mass of the building themselves. And then we have other loads that are less flexible that the consumers might not be willing to, to modify their energy consumption of these loads just to, to save some money in their final energy bill. So these ones will be harder to automate without, without uh, causing some sort of discomfort. Therefore, in this research, uh, we're trying to focus on the loads that we can easily automate in a way that we are not really penalizing the, the comfort or the satisfaction of the users. More in particularly, we'll focus on uh, thermal loads for heating and for cooling energy. Uh, and then the idea is to see how we can coordinate all these energy systems with each other in a way that buildings overall can uh, act in microgrids and are able to flatten the curve of electricity demand, reducing the peaks of electricity consumption and overall trying to align the peaks of electricity consumption with the peaks of renewable energy generation to consume electricity more effectively. So how can we achieve this? Uh, there are many different types of, of controllers. Uh, some of the main ones are the rule-based controller and the model predictive controller. The rule-based controller is pretty much the the industry standard, uh, which is based on some code that has some if else statements. And based on different conditions, it will take different control actions on whether to store more energy or release that energy. And then it's really simple, inexpensive to implement. And if, if something fails, we can really know why and we can try to fix it. However, the main disadvantage is that it's not really adaptive. So if the system that we are trying to control changes, then we need to redesign the rule-based controller manually. And then it might underperform if the system is very complex or even in multi-agent systems when there are multiple agents that are controlling themselves and, and have a, some, common, some common goal that they need to achieve, such as flattening the curve of demand of a microgrid or a district. The model predictive control is a more advanced control approach that has been, there has been extensive research in this field for 10 or 15 years in the past, and it's been very popular and it performs very well, but it's more expensive to implement. So to implement a model predictive controller, we need to develop a model of the system that we are trying to control, which can be the building or the whole microgrid. And then another disadvantage that it has is that it's not really adaptive. So if something changes in our system, which is non-stationary, then the model predictive control uh, is not able to adapt to it automatically, but we need to redesign the model in order for the, the controller to continue performing well. And then here in this research, uh, we are exploring reinforcement learning, which is more inexpensive to, to implement because it's model free. So it can learn through interaction with the environment itself or by being trained with historical data. And therefore it's, more, it's closer to a plug and play controller. You just need to implement it and it will automatically start learning from the system and performing better and better. And then if the system changes, let's say that tomorrow you buy an electric vehicle and start charging it at night, then this controller is able to read into that and be able to, to adapt and try to perform, to start performing better. And then 
And then, as I said, you can learn from historical data and through interaction. So in machine learning, there are three main uh, fields. Uh, one of them is supervised learning. Uh, in supervised learning, for example, uh, regression or classification uh, techniques, you have an output of data that is labeled and you are trying to predict. And then you have some input variables that you are using in order to make these predictions. And then you just find the error between the, the, the predictions and, and the actual values you are trying to predict. And you can train the algorithm using this error. In unsupervised learning, there's, there are only input variables. And what we are trying to do is to find patterns in this data. And these patterns uh, represent the output. So some algorithms here can be clustering or dimensionality reduction techniques. And reinforcement learning is something different. And reinforcement learning is about controlling a system based on some performance evaluation metric that we are trying to maximize over the long, over the long term. And the, the input are all this, the variables that can be used to predict these performance evaluation metrics. But the output is not a prediction. The output are the different actions that we can take to modify the behavior of the system we are trying to control in a way that in the long run, we maximize this performance evaluation metric. Uh, reinforcement learning is also an agent-based method. So in this picture here, the agent is the controller itself or is whatever is, uh, and then the environment is whatever the agent or the controller is trying to control. So in a problem like the one we have, the environment is every building or the, the whole microgrid including the storage systems and the weather conditions and anything that has an impact on the consumption of electricity. All of that is environment. And then the agent, what it's going to do is it's going to take different actions, which in this case can be storing more or less energy at different times. And it's going to take these actions to this environment, which are, is a microgrid, and it's going to observe the next states and then the rewards that it's obtaining. And the agent will try to move to different states by taking different actions with the objective of collecting different rewards and maximizing them over the long term. So the objective of the agent is to maximize the expected sum of the discounted rewards in the long run. So this is an algorithm that has been used in, in some cases very successfully. Uh, to, to tackle the many different types of, of problems. So it has been used to play video games. It has been used to play some board games like Go. So it became very popular in a, a couple of years ago because a reinforcement learning algorithm was able to be the world champion of Go in South Korea. And this was a very big deal and shows the powerfulness of, of reinforcement learning in being able to tackle very complicated problems in which there are many possible combinations of states and, and configurations of the, of the board. And it still is able to tackle many uh, difficult problems without necessarily having prior knowledge of the system that is being controlling. So first we did a literature review of, of the field of reinforcement learning for demand response, uh, because we wanted to see uh, the potential application of reinforcement learning to tackle demand response program, uh, problems. And we observed that actually in the past few years, there was a very sharp increase in the number of publications being done in, in this field, more in particular for HVAC systems and for electric vehicles. But then we also found uh, some partial gap in the literature, as we saw that only some of the papers, not many, we're actually focusing on coordinating the different buildings in a multi-agent way by making the buildings cooperate or compete against each other to obtain a, a common goal uh, as it can be um, reducing the, the peaks of electricity consumption in a specific network of buildings or, or a district or microgrid. So then we wanted to investigate more uh, about this and to find whether multi-agent reinforcement learning systems can be very useful in this field. And if they offer any advantage over independent single agent reinforcement learning agents. So in the single agent problems, the, the building will just act independently, 
trying to flatten its own electricity uh, demand rather than trying to obtain to to get a, a collective objective which could be minimizing the electricity consumption peaks in the whole district and then and then we came up with uh, three different research questions so the first one was how we can standardize and make this field of research more reproducible i will speak about that uh, later and then the second one is what are the main advantages and limitations of <clears throat> model free reinforcement learning for demand response and how we can overcome the limitations that there might be and the third research question was yeah, whether multi-agent reinforcement learning has any advantage over standard reinforcement learning and if so under what circumstances we can take advantage of multi-agent reinforcement learning rather than having any building or agent acting independently of each other. So moving to the first one about the standardization. I observed that in the computer science community that they do a lot of research on, on reinforcement learning, they develop all these different systems or problems that they try to tackle. And by developing different algorithms to tackle the same set of problems, they are different researchers are able to compare their algorithms with each other and therefore be able to know better what algorithms, what algorithms of reinforcement learning are able to perform better and under what kind of circumstances and for what kind of problems. And in the review of the literature of reinforcement learning applied to demand response, I observed that this was actually a problem because there was very little standardization and reproducibility uh, so basically, um, most researchers would develop their own problem, even in a simulated environment, that they would try to tackle. So then it was really hard to, to compare different solutions to different problems and know what solutions would work better, as different researchers would uh, try to solve different problems. And this is why I developed CityLearn, which is a, it's called an OpenAI gym environment which is used for the easy implementation of reinforcement learning algorithms in, in general. And in particular, reinforcement, uh, CityLearn focuses, is focused on urban energy systems and providing demand response and load shaping to a, a district made of multiple buildings with thermal storage devices, uh, solar generation, and dif different generation, electricity generation devices. And then this is not only well suited for the implementation of reinforcement learning, but also for the implementation of multi-agent reinforcement learning, which is something that is uncommon even in the computer science community. There are not many reinforcement learning environments that are well suited to, to tackle coordination problems of multiple independent actors that are trying to coordinate to achieve a common objective. And this is something that is very easy to to implement in, in CityLearn. And then the idea is that it's very modular, that it can modify by different researchers and that it's open source so people can share it with each other really easily. So you can develop your own reinforcement uh, learning research with this, start using it very fast and then solve a problem and make it public so others can take your solution and try to improve it or try to compare their solution with your solution. So this is how it currently works. Uh, the main data, that, data sources that I use are from Pekan Street data, database that uses household level appliances for electricity use. It also has schedules of electric vehicles, which we will be using in the future, although they are not yet implemented. And then there are also domestic hot water profiles that we use. And we use all this data and implement it into Energy Plus and we build these simulation models that, that we simulate and there are many different weather conditions and with different building ener energy models. And then in CityLearn, we implement the different energy storage and energy supply devices. The energy storage that we use is mostly thermal storage for cooling and for, and for heating energy, domestic hot water. And then the energy supply devices, we have heat pumps, electric heaters, and photovolt photovoltaic panels, and we will be implementing more. 
And then in a JSON file, it is really easy to modify any of the parameters of these devices, such as the power, the solar power that is installed, or the efficiency of the different energy generating devices, and different uh, things that then you can really easily share by just sharing a JSON file. And then also in another JSON file, it's really easy to modify many different states. And, and choose what states you want the environment to return and therefore your reinforcement learning controller to read and be able to, to act on different states. So the states are all these variables that can potentially be used as a predictor of the energy consumption and that your reinforcement learning algorithm might want to know. So just by modifying this JSON file, it's really easy to, to do. And then the two actions that we have are increasing or decreasing the amount of cooling storage for cooling energy or for domestic hot water. Uh, and then in the future, we will imp implement two other actions that will be to control batteries and to control the charge and discharge of electric vehicles. And then we did some uh, outreach because the objective is to make people be more aware about the existence of CityLearn and get to use it so they can standardize and make the research more reproducible, we created this CityLearn challenge in which we release a data set and lead CityLearn and we encourage different teams to tackle a specific problem. And then the different teams would submit their own uh, reinforcement learning agents to us and we would test them on a different data set with different buildings and see how they would coordinate. This was to see how adaptive their algorithms were. And even if they designed them for a specific data set of buildings and were able to develop a reinforcement learning controller that was able to coordinate a specific set of buildings. Then we would test it on a different set of buildings and see if the reinforcement learning controllers were still able to adapt to this new setting. And we had many teams that participated and then we compared the, the final scores. And, and then once they publish this, the research, they will be able to compare their methods with each other and be able to, to see what algorithms were working better and why. So then the next uh, research question that I proposed what, was about the advantages and limitations of model-free reinforcement learning. So what are they? And then in also how we will be able to overcome the limitations. So first, identifying them. The advantages of reinforcement learning, as I said before, was that it's a plug and play type of controller. So you don't need to develop a model of the system that you are trying to control. And then it's also adaptive. So if your system is non-stationary, you can adapt to it and to any changes and learn maybe new energy consumption patterns that a specific building might have and then still be able to control and coordinate the buildings with each other in a, in a good way. And then it can also learn from previous past historical data and pre-train or train the controllers in order to per perform better. Among the limitations are poor initial performance. Since it's model-free, that means that reinforcement learning needs to learn through interacting with the, with the environment that it's trying to control. And therefore, at the beginning, it has to take some exploratory movements or exploratory actions. And this exploration period might decrease the performance of the controller. So it might be charging or discharging the storage devices at different times in a random way, just to, to be able to learn uh, what seems to be working better. And then therefore, there's a risk of having unwanted actions. And then also it's a black box type of algorithm, which means that we cannot really see a specific code and know what reinforcement learning is doing and understand why it is doing it. And therefore, if something fails, we might not necessarily know why it failed. So the main question now is how can we overcome some of these, these challenges? And then also, uh, how does multi-agent reinforcement learning compare with single agent reinforcement learning? And then whether it provides any advantage over standard reinforcement learning and under what kind of circumstances. So for this, we, we created uh, these different models of 
uh, four different microgrids in a case study. Oh, each of these microgrids had nine different buildings of different types and was located in a different uh, climate zone. And then we use reinforcement learning to control the energy storage of the different buildings to try to shape the electricity demand of the whole district and try to flatten it overall. And then to do this, we use five different evaluation performance metrics that we would evaluate to see how well the reinforcement learning agents were, were doing. All of these ha have to do with reducing the peaks of electricity consumption and overall trying to flatten the curve of electricity demand as much as possible in the whole microgrid. And then as I mentioned earlier, in reinforcement learning, first we need to pick what states are we going to use. The states are all those variables that tell the reinforcement learning controller uh, uh, what actions will work the best. And, and the states have to be variables that are good predictors of the reward function or the performance metric. Uh, in this case, all these performance evaluation metrics uh, are functions of the net electricity consumption of the buildings. And therefore, all the states have to be variables that are good predictors of the net electricity consumption of the buildings. So we fitted different uh, linear regression uh, models, and then we also use decision trees. And by looking at the coefficients, we were able to see what types of states were better predictors of the electricity consumption. And then we use these states as variables into our reinforcement learning agents that they could use to try to perform better and take the right actions and try to flatten the overall curve of electricity demand. And then the next step when you are designing a reinforcement learning controller is to, to design the reward function. The reward function is that function that the reinforcement learning agent is going to try to be maximizing in the long term by obtaining different rewards and trying to maximize the, the, long sum, the, the accumulated sum of the expected rewards. So the different rewards will depend on the net electricity consumption of every building, which is the, par the, the variable E in this, in this table. So when E is positive, it means that the building is generating more energy that is consuming, and therefore it's sending surplus energy back to the electrical grid. And if it's negative, that means the building is consuming more electricity from the grid than it is sending back by generating. And therefore it's over consuming. So in order to shape, to create a reward that tries to flatten the electricity consumption, what we did was to take the electricity consumption and raise it to the power of different co the ex exponents. In this case, one, two, and three. And we observed that the higher the exponent of the net electricity consumption, the sharper, the, the more aggressive the flattening of the electricity demand consumption is, especially in the summer. And we also try with higher exponents, such as four, but then the performance stopped improving. So we found that using the net, net electricity consumption as a reward to the power of three is actually a good reward function in order to do load shaping in the whole district of nine buildings. However, this is a single agent reward and it seems to work well, but then the question is, since the agents are acting independently, and this, each of these rewards is independent to each building. So we are providing each building with a reward function that depends on the electricity consumption of only that building. So therefore, there's not really a coordination. Each building is just trying to flatten its electricity consumption curve independently of each other. So is this really an optimal solution or can we do better than this? Because maybe by allowing some coordination of different buildings, we are able to flatten the overall curve of electricity demand of the whole district as a whole much better than if all buildings are trying to act independently and without coordination. So then I focus on, on re redesigning the reward function in a way that it not only has a, a greedy component or a single agent component, but it also has some collective component. So here the variable E is the independent individual component of the electricity consumption. 
or the individual net electricity consumption of the specific building. And then, and then we have the other component here that I added to the new reward. That is the collective net electricity demand. This is the electricity demand of the whole district. So what I did was to multiply the individual component of the electricity demand of the specific building with the electricity demand of the whole neighborhood or the whole district. And therefore now every agent is trying to, to, to minimize both, not only its own peak of electricity consumption, but also the peak of electricity consumption of the whole district. So here I will explain uh, how this reward function works. Uh, so when the, the building is over generating uh, and is sending more electricity to the grid than it is consuming, I reward the building with a positive reward as long as the district is over consuming. And this is because the building is trying to, to provide more energy to the, to the whole district when the, the rest of the district as a whole is trying to consume electricity from the grid. So this is a, a behavior that we need to reward for every specific building. We want every building to provide more energy back to the grid when the whole district is actually doing the opposite. And then if the building is over consuming, when the, build, the district is also over consuming, we want to penalize this behavior. Uh, what we want to do is the opposite. Not, we don't want the, each in the independent building to be consuming a lot of energy from the grid when the whole district is also doing the same because that's just not, not efficient in, in reducing the peaks of electricity consumption from the grid. And then as long as the, as the whole district is not, uh, is not consuming any energy from the grid or is actually sending more energy to the grid than it is consuming, then all the rewards will, to every building will be zero because we have a behavior that is already, is already good because the, the whole neighborhood would already be self-sufficient. So we implemented this reward with this collective component. And what we observed was that actually the behavior of the, of the buildings was worse and that the, the score that we obtained of, from the microgrid was uh, actually worse than, than with the independent components. So here's this, this, the scores I need to explain. The lower the score, the better the, the behavior of the building. And then all the scores are normalized by the evaluation performance metrics of the of a rule based controller that is in that I show in purple. So if the building is obtaining if the district is obtaining a score of 0 0.85, that means that the mean of all the performance metrics that I showed before, the peak demand, the the ramping, the, the load factor, all of these are 15% better than those of the rule based controller, which is uh, which is one. So, so yeah, the, the interesting thing was that by providing this collective component of the reward, the, the whole district was actually performing worse and not better as we expected, because we were expecting it to, to coordinate and to improve the performance by, by providing this collective reward. So the main question is why? Why when we provide this collective component and we try to make all the buildings coordinate through the reward function, they are actually the worst. And it's because the collective component violates the so-called Markov property. So I won't explain in too much detail what it is, but uh, in short, what, it, what the Markov property says is that if the states are no longer good predictors of the reward function, then this violates this property. And then the, the reinforcement learning agent won't be able to perform well because it doesn't really know why the environment or the system under control is doing what it does. So at first, when we had a single agent reward, it was only depending on the electricity consumption of each individual building. And therefore, we designed the states to be good predictors of the electricity consumption of each individual building. So this was not an issue. But now I'm using uh, I, I'm using states that are designed to predict the energy consumption of each building to also predict the energy consumption of the whole district. And, and then they are not good predictors of this whole energy consumption of the district. 
and therefore the, the agent is underperforming. So how can we fix this? So to fix this, we need to provide the controllers with the states that are good predictors of the electricity consumption of the whole district and not only of that specific building. And for that, they need to share information with each other as in the form of states uh, between different buildings that allows them to predict how much other buildings are likely going to consume. And for this, we developed uh, this multi-agent reinforcement learning and agent with iterative uh, sequential action selection that I'm going to explain now and that we just submitted to, to the Build Sys conference. So the way it works is uh, we use CityLearn and we implemented the reinforcement learning agent to coordinate the district that I showed earlier for, uh, with nine different buildings in different climate zones. And, and then the actions of the controller is to store more or less energy at different times or charge, charge and discharge the energy storage systems. So the type of reinforcement learning controller that we use is called soft actor critic, which is a state of the art reinforcement learning controller that is used for problems in which we have states and actions that are continuous variables. And then we modify this reinforcement learning controller using an algorithm that is my own contribution that is called a multi-agent reinforcement learning with iterative sequential action selection. So the way it works is that every specific building will have a regression model using gradi a gradient boosting decision trees. And this model is going to take data from the building and from the states in order to predict the expected electricity consumption if the building takes a given action. So now that the buildings can predict their own electricity consumption if they take a certain action, what they do is that first, uh, we make a random line or a queue with all the buildings that are randomly sorted. And then the first building in that line will select a given action under some states. And it will share the predicted energy consumption that is predicting using this regression algorithm. And it will share this prediction with our, another random building. And then the next building will receive this prediction of the energy consumption of the previous building. And then using the, the, its own states and the electricity consumption from the previous building is going to select, but not, not yet take, but only, only choose another action. And then using the states and the action is going to make its own prediction. And then it's going to send to the next uh, building randomly its own prediction plus the energy consumption that the buildings before it are expecting to consume. So long story short, every building is going to know the expected electricity consumption from all the buildings beforehand, before that building. And then knowing that information will be able to take more accurate decisions. So if one building sees that most buildings before it are going to consume a lot of energy, then that building might might decide to consume less energy and, and try to achieve some degree of coordination. And then, as I mentioned, this is not only a sequential process of picking the actions and sharing the information with one another, but it's also iterative. So once all the buildings share the information with each other, the last building shares the information again with the first building in the line, which receives all the predictions and then selects a new action, makes the prediction again, and then this whole process of picking actions, making predictions of their own energy consumption and sharing it with the next building is going to be repeated through different iterations. Therefore, each building is going to know how much aggregated electricity all the buildings before it are expecting to, to consume. And then they will share another variable, which is how far every building is on the line. So the last building, if, if it knows that is the last one on the line, knows that the information that is receiving is going to be more accurate as it will be the last one to pick uh, an action. And therefore all the predictions of the buildings before it will be more accurate because they will, they will not change their own actions after the last action of the last building is taken. 
And then, as I said before, the actions are selected iteratively, but they are not actually taken and, and applied to the environment until the last iteration. So until all the buildings have, have chosen their actions. And then this is a way of sharing information in a decentralized way, which each building knows how much expected aggregated electricity consumption all the other buildings are going to consume. And then since the information is aggregated, then the data is always kept anonymously. So each building is not just sharing its own electricity consumption that is expecting to have with other buildings, but is sharing the expected electricity consumption also of the buildings before it. So then all the data is kept anonymous by using the aggregated data of the energy consumption, rather than the energy consumption of just one individual building. And then this approach is also scalable. So it doesn't matter how many buildings or agents we have, but they will only share two, two different variables with each other. So each building is going to pick a random building and just share two, vari two variables. And they will all do that. And that's regardless on, on how many buildings we have, which is very interesting as other approaches will have a central controller that is controlling all the buildings. So the more buildings they have, then the harder it is to control them. In this approach, any new building can join this network and start sharing information with just one other building randomly and be able to, uh, to coordinate. Jose? Yeah. Can the queue change? The, queue, the, the length of the queue? No, just the order of uh, the yes. building. Yeah, the so in every, in every time step, the buildings are sorted randomly. In every time step. In every time step, yeah. Do you want to speak to the cost of that iteration, the computational cost? Yeah, it's not very, it's not very computationally costly. I mean, uh, so we usually two to 10 iterations is fine uh, to obtain a, a good performance. And I mean, yeah, it takes just a few seconds. It's not. And, and what's your convergence criterion? Using then then the convergence uh, criteria is something that, uh, I mean, I tested it empirically, but then I would need to do uh, yeah, theoretically analysis in the future in order to, to see if I can add some learning rate to it and try to find a better convergence. But what I observe is that actually just using uh, two iterations works, which means that the buildings would, might not have to iterate many different times, but just by iterating twice, they will share enough information with each other to perform well. But I need, indeed, I need to see if by adding a learning rate and having a convergence criteria and running through many more iterations, I can improve the performance even more than this. Did you see any improvement after the second iteration? So empirically, uh, I did, uh, I, so I used the four different uh, climate zones and then I did a case study that I'm going to discuss. So for the, for the case study, I saw that two iterations was performing better than 10 iterations. But then in some of the other climates, uh, 10 iterations seems to be working the best. But then beyond 10 iterations, uh, the performance was not improving. And then, so I implemented the same reward that I implemented before and that was performing uh, worse. But, but now changing this algorithm and sharing this information between the different buildings. And using this same reward function, but making these modifications, then all the uh, microgrids actually perform better than all the other controllers. Which means that uh, this type of approach of sharing information with each other was successful in, in coordinating the, the different buildings and being able to make use of this multi-agent reward in order to, to coordinate them. Uh, and this is because now by sharing this information, this collective component of the reward is more easily predictable using the states of the, of the agent. And here we can see the, the daily profiles under the climate zone 2E, 2A. And for a given, uh, 
for, for a typical day, for an average day. So, so what we can see is if that the, well, the, the main net load with no storage is the brown line, and then the blue line is the, the rule-based controller. So in the rule-based controller is uh, designed independently for the buildings and they are all doing the same. So since the buildings are not really trying to coordinate, what it happens is that since the amount of storage that there's available is really high, then the buildings just reduce the peak of electricity consumption that was happening at 4 p.m. in the middle of the day. But now they are just shifting and creating two new peaks, one later at night and one very early in the morning around 5 to 6 a.m. This is because around 5 to 6 a.m. the coefficient of performance of the heat pumps that they are using was higher because of cooler temperatures. So then they were all trying to take advantage from it by consuming more energy early in the morning and storing it. But then they were just creating a new peak at this time because each building was not taking into account what other buildings were doing. But it was just trying to, to optimize its own load curve independently. On the other hand, the re reinforcement learning controllers were able to, to learn this pattern better and also to, to coordinate, especially the, the multi-agent reinforcement learning co controller that I, that I mentioned before. And flatten the overall curve of electricity demand. And then in, in the second research question that I propose, I said that uh, it's important to understand how we can overcome some of the challenges and limitations of having a poor initial performance and having a risk of, of having unwanted actions by the controllers. So then what I did was to do a more realistic case study. In the previous case study, I would use the same, uh, the same year of data and I would retrain the controller on that uh, same year again and again, just trying to, to improve the electricity consumption. In this second case study, I use a five year I use five years of data uh, of real weather conditions. And then I implement the reinforcement learning agents online there. And they try to improve the performance uh, just over the years. And then that way I can see how many years or months it takes for the reinforcement learning controllers to improve the performance and obtain some reasonable performance. And and then I was able to see that indeed at the beginning when we implement reinforcement learning controllers in a new building or in, in a new set of buildings, then initially during the first six months or a first year, they will have a very bad performance. And this was particularly noticeable in the summer because the, the rule controller was specifically designed to mitigate the peaks of electricity consumption in the summer when they are, more, they are worse. So then the reinforcement learning agent by taking random actions of storing, of charging and discharging the storage devices almost randomly, they, they were not able to perform well in any of the performance metrics that we were anal analyzing. So then how can we solve this? Uh, how can we uh, modify the reinforcement learning controller in such a way that the initial performance is not, that, is not as bad? So what we could do is to implement a rule-based controller first collect, to collect all the data and then provide this data to pre-train the reinforcement learning agent that it would perform afterwards. And this indeed worked and was able to, to mitigate this problem at first, as expected. But then this is at the expense of long-term uh, performance. So when we do this, then in the long term, the reinforcement learning controller that was using the rule-based controller at the beginning was not able to perform as well as the other controllers, but it performed worse. So this is something to take into account, uh, depending on whether we want to focus more on an initial good performance or in long-term uh, performance, then we might want to, to make more exploratory actions at the beginning or try to, to act more safely. But this is also another topic of, of research that would be very interesting to see if it's possible to have a safe or a rule-based controller that is taking decisions at first and that is acting well and still be able to use then a reinforcement learning agent that can have a good long-term performance. 
So then in the, in the first year here, here I show a specific week for the summer period of the, of the first year. And we can see that the reinforcement learning agents are, are just acting randomly and they are not particularly reducing the peaks of electricity consumption. But then by the, five, by, by the fifth year, they are able to perform much better and to flatten the peaks of electricity consumption and to perform better than the rule-based controller, for example. And this is for a specific week of, of the summer. Between, yeah, between the, the two reinforcement learning controllers, in this chart is not, uh, it's not super obvious which one is performing better. But in the other chart, we were able to see that in general, the metrics of the rule-based controller plus the, the reinforcement learning controller uh, this performance is not as good as just using the reinforcement learning controller with exploratory movements and exploratory actions. So then the main conclusions of my work is that reinforcement learning is indeed a, a type of algorithm that is very well suited for the control of distributed energy resources and for load shaping and that multi-agent reinforcement learning offers certain coordination advantages and this is most evident when the energy storage capacity of the systems that we are trying to control is really high. Because then co co coordination actually becomes much more important because we want to avoid having all the agents taking very similar actions and actually sh shifting the peaks of electricity consumption rather than shaving them. And then I, I develop decentralized a type of reinforcement learning agent for multi-agent coordination. Uh, that is a good alternative to some other approaches that are price responsive, uh, demand response. So rather than focusing on tracking the electricity prices and trying to respond to them and trying to minimize the cost of electricity of each specific building, what we did was to forget for some time about the electricity prices and then just focus about the microgrid itself and the shape of the curve of demand and just make all the buildings coordinate with each other in such a way that they provide good load shaping capabilities in a decentralized way. So if there's a new building that joins this grid, it's able to start sharing information and start coordinating with the rest of this grid in a decentralized way. This is good because we don't need a central aggregator that needs to coordinate all these buildings and it keeps the data anonymous. And then also uh, the proper pricing mechanisms would have to be designed to properly reward the individual buildings. This is something we didn't focus on, but of course some of the buildings might be taking uh, actions that might profit the overall grid, might, but might not be the best for them. So therefore there should be a proper pricing mechanism to properly uh, reward these buildings economically for providing these benefits to the grid. And then in the research, we took many, state, uh, many steps towards the standardization and reproducibility of, re of the research by, by developing CityLearn and, and then with the help of the colleagues from CCU Boulder, developing the CityLearn challenge and, and encouraging people to participate but then there's more steps that researchers should make in the field in order to make the research more easily shareable and reproducible for benchmarking purposes. And this is something that can really increase the, the pace at which progress is made in this field by making researchers more capable of comparing their algorithms with each other. And then we also observe that some domain knowledge is often desirable the implementation of reinforcement learning for demand response or in actual systems. It can be through constraints that we can uh, set in the action selection process in which the building is taking exploratory movements. We can constrain, constrain them so they are not completely random. We can also have a backup controller uh, for sa more safe operation in a way that if the reinforcement learning controllers are taking actions that are, not, are clearly not good, then we can switch back to a rule-based controller, for example, and we can have a more safe operation. And then there's a, a great potential for, to do more research on approaches that are a mix of model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. 
So we might not need very detailed models of, of buildings or systems under control, but sometimes we can have some simplified models that we create using our domain knowledge and that can provide already a good starting point for reinforcement learning agents to perform decently well. And then they can continue to improve over time and still continue to maintain their adaptive capabilities. So over the course of these four years of my PhD, I was able to have uh, many, of this, many of these, much of this research published. Uh, this paper was uh, published in, in applied energy and was in a special section for the top 3% of the papers and was my literature review paper that I was discussing earlier. And then I also was able to get a best paper award for the conference CISBAT in Switzerland and then a silver paper award too. I also supervised three different master theses in 2018. And I also had uh, multiple oral presentations and posters in, in different universities. So I want to thank uh, everyone for being here today and attending my defense and to all the members of my lab for being here over the course of these four years. More, more in particular to Professor Soltanagi for all the, the advising and, and the supervision. And of course, to all the members of my committee for being part of, of the committee and for providing me with very insightful feedback and evaluating my, my work. Thank you, everyone.